Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, Anna Xu talks about the challenges of becoming a mom early on in her academic career. Writing a book with a baby crawling on the floor, many, many sleepless nights, um, but I've done it. I defended my uh, PhD when he was one year old, but by the time I was already postdoc, so that was a tough time. And I... Her volunteer work to champion women in STEM, including getting some fun tattoos. I wanted to, uh, for her to do is actually do this female hand, this female hand that is holding this very beautiful, old-fashioned, uh, unique microscope because of this whole well, representation of women in STEM and so on. And the importance of stopping to consider what challenges your colleagues might be facing. Realizing what your colleagues might go through and what is actually being, what does it mean being on the autism spectrum? You know, what does it mean to have ADHD? What does it mean to, to have a chronic disease and so on? All in this episode of The Microscopist. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York. Today on the Microscopist, I'm joined by Anna Schutz from Maastricht University. Anna, how are you? Hi, Peace. So great that I can join this. I'm doing fine. What we just said earlier, it's still really warm here. So once this recording will come out in September, maybe it's not so warm anymore. But yeah, and I'm sitting here in my Luxendo um, T-shirt, light sheet rocks. I actually turned it upside down. What? Well, well, it's actually the logo is on, on the other side. This is the back side of the t-shirt, but I thought it was cool. Um, I'm going to comment yeah. on the t-shirt because it, it does. It <laughs> light sheet rocks is a really cool t-shirt to have on there. I really like. Yeah, it. exactly. So that's why I was kind of hoping they would do it uh, the other way around. And I saw you also have shirts from this podcast. We do, and you'll be getting one. Oh wow! <laughs> So straight afterwards, Jason will email you asking for your size. And uh, uh, I don't think we've got a choice of colours anymore. I think we used to. It might be black or white. I don't know. But Jason. Yeah, but that's that's yeah. pretty awesome. When I was doing many years ago, five, five, six years ago, I did this MBO course at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden, organised by Pavel Tumanchak. And there I got already a Luxembourg T-shirt. I wore it to yeah, bits. It was completely... It was just black in the end. Nothing was on it anymore. So I was glad when Luxando came over to our campus and they did a demo there. So they brought more T-shirts. So I'm now all ready to go. <laughs> T-shirted out. I, I think my team have got some yeah. of the T-shirts too. I, I could say uh, Elmi. I used to wear the Elmi T-shirts quite oh, yeah. a lot. Seasonal yeah. ones that are popular. Yeah, yeah, this was all uh, pre-pandemic somehow. I mean... I honestly haven't traveled since then. I mean, it's still a little bit weird and lots of other personal reasons. And going through divorce is also not uh, exactly a walk in the park. And then being alone with two little ones. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to going back there and getting T-shirts <laughs> and connecting with people. Thinking on that, we will come to the other content in a minute. But actually, I had loads of the Elmi every year. I, so I had the whole series of Elmi T-shirts. And... In the end, actually, the friend we were talking about before we started recording when he was in hospital. Uh, so I donated them all to him. Oh. It actually also showed he was a scientist. He wanted to make sure mm -hmm. people were aware that he wasn't. He, mm -hmm. They could talk to him and talk about the drugs he was having to take and everything. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, it was just a way for him to show that he was a scientist and to just yeah. give that extra detail. And he kind of knew mm -hmm. what to do. But anyway, that's an aside. So, Anna, that's yeah. nice. <laughs> all. Congratulations, because you've now started your own academic group. Yeah, well, I'm still on my own, but it feels right and it feels great. And uh, yeah, I recently started since June, actually, at the medical faculty at our university. And my my field will switch from what I did earlier was human brain research and a little bit of cancer to 100% cancer. And there will be breast cancer and gynecologic cancer types. And I'm especially excited about this because we, well, in my family uh, runs endometrial cancer. And you can't see that now, but I have a uterus tattooed on my chest. And I also have a 
we just see that like a little fetus and also a, you know like a uterus and I'm fascinated by this whole subject of reproduction as well as oncology and yeah it's a dream come true and a way to do this so, I just noticed yeah. that those who are listening won't be able to see this but there's actually a really cool oh. microscope oh yeah a tattoo yeah, yeah. as yeah. well a very old school tattoo not a, not a van moving hook but <laughs> classic brass type uh, yeah exactly tattoo. exactly i um brought to my artist a few different of images and i said hey this is what i like and what i also wanted to uh, for her to do is actually do this female hand this female hand that is holding this very beautiful old-fashioned uh, unique microscope because of this whole well representation of women in stem and so on and I got this for almost, yeah, I want to say my personal anniversary, let's say 10 years in microscopy. And then I thought this would be really cool. And uh, I waited also a long time until I found the right, um, you know, the right uh, design. And I also have a few from the UK from when I was at the Light Sheet Conference and where was it, Manchester? Um, so that's cool. Yeah, I also at uh, Society for Neuroscience, I collect a few tattoos once i was traveling yeah so i collect t oh, i used to have t-shirts you just have tattoos <laughs> for each one that you go to i'm looking forward to the microscopist tattoo yeah i mean hey why not I, I, yeah sometimes people call you crazy for doing this but okay and i mean my neck tattoo was quite and a uh, statement let's say as well and uh yeah i always thought actually i want to do the the full sleeves by the time I might have the faculty member job and the permanent position. But then I, I don't know, it's this whole thing of, you know, life is short. Why wait until God knows when in a few years time? And then I thought, you know what, I'm going to do it. And within, I don't remember anymore, months or something, I had it all completely full arms, the chest and the entire back, everything. Um, yeah, well, I like that. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, the one with the hand on the, the, the lady's hand on the yeah. mic. Uh, and there's, there's many things to cover today. Yeah. There's, there's your career. I want to understand how you got into where you are today. Uh, women in STEM and how you've been supporting. So I know you're quite active uh, on a volunteer, mm -hmm. volunteering side for many aspects, not just women yeah. in STEM. And obviously mm -hmm. some mental health issues in yes. the past as well. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go back. And I just I'm gonna go back to when you were a young, young child. Yes. And what was the first job that you can remember actually aspiring to be? Oh wow, that's a good question. So I I think um, my mom always tells me these stories. Once I could walk, I would uh, walk around and collect little insects and so on. So zoology and any kind of animal studies also was already very early on. And I think when I was in kindergarten and early days of school, I wanted to become a veterinarian. I mean, I grew up on a farm where my uh, parents had these large animals and this is what I really liked. I wanted to do this as well. And they would always say, ah, oh, that's not for a girl, you know, that's not really for you. So I went then in the direction of zoology, what I actually studied, so classic biology. And um, what I also, I mean, this whole science aspect. So I, when I was seven, my parents gave me my first little microscope as a gift. And then I even, I didn't realize it, but I made my own little lab journal. I wrote down notes. I would draw what I saw through the microscope and I would collect samples, I don't know, insects, uh, hairs from my dog or my poor father <laughs> he had to give me some samples. And this was so yeah, I lost. I, I became lost in this world of of microscopy, and that was it. I, I I don't know how to explain. I mean, you know how it feels when you are imaging, but this was for me incredible to see these things that are otherwise invisible. And then, yeah, you know, the rest is history. That that was it. <laughs> I'd love to know what percentage of scientists had that at that really early age, because there's, there's a fair few, and there's others that came to science much later. Uh, yeah, it'd be quite interesting to know how much that is. So, so you've always been science driven. So, what was your first degree, and where did you do your degree? So, yeah, I had always been fascinated by science, and uh, the well, what I said, I studied 
classic biology in, I don't know, it's, it's Lower Saxony in Germany. It's, it's called Göttingen. It's quite famous actually in Germany. And yeah, there I did my degree. And I don't know to what it, uh, extend you now want to go from science into mental health because that had been really eventful and that had been one of the key moments that I didn't realize at the time would shape then the rest of you know the course of my life let's say so, so what so yeah what happened yeah so then I was I mean I'm my parents uh how do you say they have four kids right so I have three siblings and then I was when I was uh, moving out for me, it was clear. I wanted to go to study and I really want to learn more about science. And that was for me amazing. That's That was clear. So I went there and my parents, they told me from the beginning, we do not have any money to support you. So I had to work multiple jobs and this whole kind of almost poverty thing. I mean, sometimes I had not even money to buy food. It was in hindsight ridiculous how I actually managed that. And then I was hitting a, a point, probably multiple reasons, because then I failed a couple of exams, I had to work so much. And then I, I thought, okay, th 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 this cannot go on. I don't know. I didn't even realize there would be a tomorrow, right? And this all ended in a suicide attempt. And then I, I mean, then I wouldn't speak about it. Obviously, I wouldn't speak about it. It was just what it was. Uh, luckily now this was something where I'd say I came out of it a lot stronger. I'm not saying this is something you should, you know, experience. Obviously it's horrible, but this made me the person I am today. So that, yeah, I, I would say I have become a more resilient person throughout this whole time. And I'm just so grateful every day I wake up and I'm so happy and I, I can't even explain. Everything is just, I mean, when you put it in relation to, you know, you had a bad meeting, oh, great, or a stupid email. I mean, <laughs> this is this is nothing compared to that when you think about it. So then you did your degree, you went on to a PhD? Uh, first, I did a three-year science, how do you call it, the scientific fellowship in Germany at the University of Lübeck. And there I started with intravital to photomicroscopy of the mouse gut. Yeah. And then, you know, you see all these things uh, live happening. You see the immune reactions, you see nanoparticle uptake and so on. And that is, yeah, I don't know how to explain it. It is it's absolutely amazing. And then I thought I didn't even realize that something like this would be possible. And yeah, that was it. So I, I knew... I'm going to stay in imaging. And since then, not one day has been boring or ever that I thought I want to do something different. <laughs> so, proper sort of scientific microscope. Sorry, what, what do you, uh, you remember? What the first scientific, so not the one you had at home, but you know, the first sort of professional microscope you used. Remember what the first microscope was? Um, yeah, that was a um, uh, Leica two photon. And they also had a, back in the day, it's called Stilla Vision, like a triumph scope mm -hmm. uh, there. It um, was an institute of biomedical optics where they had different types and then they could play around with the different setups and so on. And yeah, so intravital to photomicroscopy. So why the move to Maastricht after that? Hmm, yeah, I, I wanted to experience a little bit uh, live abroad. And then for whatever reason, I went to a conference in Zurich and then I thought, oh, Zurich is really awesome. So I was thinking Switzerland. And then I talked to a few people at the poster session. They said, you know what? Netherlands is great. I thought, okay. I never really thought about that. But then I looked up um, a couple of uh, yeah, job advertisements and maybe it's, you know, sometimes things happen how they should happen or so. And there was this position in Maastricht uh, on um, incontinence, actually, <laughs> on bladder research. And I thought, okay, gut and bladder is not too far away. Maybe I just try. And I applied. It was actually a Marie Curie fellowship and got it. That was that. I mean, I mean, <laughs> yeah. And that was at Maastricht. Yeah, exactly. And since then, I'm here. So that was 20... Uh, when did I apply? 2010 and 2011, I came to Maastricht and since then I'm here. Yeah. 
Well, you've been in Maastricht now for 13 years. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I should totally get a Maastricht uh, tattoo now. <laughs> yeah. You, you haven't got anything to Ma Maastricht or? Yeah, well, the, the, the sign stopped in the way, right? So that kind of counts. That's a strange, isn't it? Because we live in a world where everyone is passionate about microscopes. <laughs> certainly the vast majority are, I think, at that point. So, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, I think um, there's a different type of passion, right? There's this passion of, hey, I want to get good results and apply it to something, or I really want to get my hands on it and build it and so on. And over the years, I have seen different types of passion, I would say. And... Uh, yeah, some that's maybe stand out. So, yeah, and if you think about the conferences, you have the end users, you have the developers. Yeah. So that there is that, and you have the enablers. I, I think exactly. that's maybe, um, and that's. In the of that. That's also something I really like is to be somewhere the the person that builds builds a bridge uh, that you have the people the well the clinicians you have the data scientists you have the biologists and they all speak a different language. And there I think the whole aspect of science communication is so important in finding a way to communicate this. So, yeah. On your uh, your voluntary side as well. So you, you've got yes. a full-time job. Uh, yeah. You've got family. Uh, yes. you can come to. Uh, and you've got time for volunteering as well. Yeah. I mean... Uh, it had to take a little bit of a backseat, but I mean, depends on what you call volunteering and whatnot. But I had been uh, a few years ago, I had been volunteering for Dragonfly Mental Health, which is a global mental health organization. So everyone who's listening can just type in Google Dragonfly Mental Health and they have lots of amazing resources and things uh, available online. Um, and then I would, for example, uh, when I a few years while back I started my blog it's an I call it academic mental health uh, blog and well uploading a story takes a couple of minutes you can do that after work or something like that um, but that was something I definitely was passionate about after probably 10 years of um, mentoring high school girls in the field of STEM I kind of paused that for a bit um, and then I'm also a member of the so-called Maastricht Young Academy that is really passionate about changing things in academia that could be changed and policy making and so on. And they just now took the lead of the outreach group. Um, but that is, well, I don't know. I don't call that volunteering, I would say. So we've done all that. And do you think that actually helped you get your academic post or did it hinder I, mm. I think i know what the answer is to this but i'm going to ask anyway doing all this voluntary stuff this extra stuff outside of just being in the lab do you think that was beneficial to your career that's a good question and i would say mm, i mean i'm not sure i mean now there is this time where we in, in the netherlands have this uh, rewards and recognition where we say Everyone should be recognized and rewarded for their unique talents. Some people are excellent teachers. Others are super good in grant writing. And obviously, in a way, you need to do both, right? Or all the different things. But um, it's great to have unique talent. But I would say back in the day when I have done this, it was maybe rather a bit of a hindrance. And it's a little, I have to be careful how to formulate this. But um, obviously, you... Uh, you were asked, well, I was asked to do a lot of lab work then. You know, when you are a PhD student, you have to do certain things. When you're a postdoc, you have to do certain things. With getting higher up, you have a little bit more independence and then you need to figure out what to do with your time on your own. But, yeah, but I, but I think the times have changed. And now I would say, if you get the opportunity, do it. However... I also want to say that I've never done anything because it looks good on the CV, because that's nonsense. I mean, <laughs> that you're doesn't work. Then. You're not going to volunteer for something you're not going to, well, you shouldn't volunteer for something you're not going to enjoy. I, I'd even imagine that actually it's probably yeah. helped you in in being able to juggle because you'd have had those aspects. And actually, if you looked at a CV and you saw someone who yeah. volunteered, 
and they're passionate about it, it shows they can create time. And, you know, you should be able to have more than one thing in your life. Yeah. And it's not yeah. work. And I think that volunteering is part of your other side. Yeah, by now it is also this case. And I, I think even when you go for these larger personal grants, now that they also say, hey, what have you done in terms of outreach? And what have you done in terms of, I don't know, um, yeah, these kind of things, you know, uh, advocacy and then being a member of these specific groups. But back in the day, it, I mean, it sounds like I'm God knows how old, but then it wasn't quite like that. Then it was really about this, what's the impact factor of your journal? How many papers do you have? And I'm thinking we are going a little bit in the direction where, you know, more the the other things are counting. And um, the, yeah, open science, you know, all these things. Yeah. yeah. And that's the same in the UK, actually. Very, very similar now. That even okay. CV, the government funding, you don't put in a CV. Uh, you now have to do a case about which includes your outreach, your impacts and your other bits around. It's not all yeah. about applications, which is, which is healthy to a degree, but you still have to publish, yeah. obviously. Yeah. And publish actually if you for those who are listening or watching, what is your blog website address? It's, it's quite easy, but it's my name. <laughs> it's w my name. It's 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 anashi.com. And the reason being was that I was well, the story behind it is that I was um working in the pandemic in the lab and well, let's say I was working in the pandemic. Uh, online and also in person a little bit and there I came across a few people that were dealing with either a suicide attempt a suicide attempt of a family member and then the tip of the iceberg was that a former colleague of mine told me that she had an abortion and she doesn't think that you can have kids in your PhD and then she said hey Anna you had a child halfway through your PhD if you maybe speak about this more, maybe more encouraged to actually have a child as well. And I could not believe that this was a thing. And um, then I thought, you know what? I called my brother and said, hey, you know how to make this website, you know? <laughs> Can you please help me? And then he did this for me or we did it together. I uploaded the first couple of own personal um, stories. And then I thought I need a name. What could I name this blog? I don't know, ach, whatever. And he said, yeah, for now it's your name and then you can later on change it. Yeah, well, the day never came, the website never finished, the name never finished. And then I thought, who cares? Um, I just want to get these stories out. And then it went completely viral. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I, by now, I think, yeah, several million people read these stories and I shared them also on Twitter. Never had social media really before this blog and I only started Twitter actually to share the stories and hundreds if not thousand messages have reached me people saying hey you helped me so much feeling seen and heard and um and then the great thing was when someone said hey I, I feel recognized in this particular story can you share mine and then I thought oh, okay and then I had to pause at some point because it was getting too much yeah that was the story <laughs> I've got to say, well done yeah. to your brother as well, though, because the website looks really cool when you go to it. I do like the signature. Yeah. Well, I thought that was a really nice touch. Yeah, yeah, That's it's uh, it's 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 actually true. I got a lot of uh, comments on that, and um, yeah, I was a picky about a few things, but then I mean, obviously, the research section still really needs quite a bit of work. Um, and that's something I now think, because I also like, um, I've done a few events, for example, this brain science meets um, data science and microscopy with pint of science in a pub and sharing science. And it was really fun that I thought I should post pictures of that, uh, like I put on Twitter and then also linking protocols and making it more open access, actually. Because I really like what people are doing there. But, you know, I'm just one person. <laughs> so it's, yeah. It hasn't stopped there, though, has it? Because they've been writing articles. So you've got, you've yeah. got your lab science. Yeah. But you also have your mental health science that's going in yeah. the likes of Nature and other magazines. So the popular magazines, yeah. the, the late public magazines, mm -hmm. as well as the actual sort of the hardcore niche science journals and magazines. Yeah. Well. Yes, actually true. I mean... 
Um, so it's now in Nature, Science, Wiley. Uh, yeah, as I said, another Nature invited uh, papers uh, up and running. And I have a couple more things up my sleeve, but I will not uh, yet talk about it. But um, that was then for me also completely, yeah, I don't know, a surprise that someone or uh, these editors would say, hey, I read your blog. Fantastic. Would you write for us? Yeah, I mean, that's so cool because why I've done it, not so much, again, that it looks great on my CV or what, that was really never the point. The point was give this a larger platform, give this a larger platform that I say, hey, um, bring mental health on the agenda. Um, and then it uh, made waves in that sense that I was invited to speak at, uh, for example, PhD, how do you say, uh, <clears throat> uh, retreats and so on. And directly to the PhD students, but also to the supervisors, what I liked. So well, and I was going to point out that, you know, e even if you're listening, watching and you don't suffer from mental health or don't think you're suffering from mental health, it's worth reading some of the blogs because you might recognize it in other people around you that you may not otherwise. It, it helps you pick up the symptoms earlier yeah. and then maybe step in to actually offer support or to raise this because quite often the person involved with mental health doesn't necessarily recognize it first themselves. And yeah. Useful so true. It yes, it, it's it's absolutely true, and I mean, this was also why I did with um with another colleague or colleague slash friend from the law faculty, Mark Kawakami. We founded this Flourish Maastricht, this group actually to increase the mental health support, but also the whole literacy around it. Because I think I truly believe is when you know more about it, it's you know really helpful. Also realizing what your colleagues might go through and what is actually being, what does it mean being on the autism spectrum? You know, what does it mean to have ADHD? What does it mean to, to have a chronic disease and so on? And um, yeah, it's it's uh, important. I feel, but yeah, we had been hibernating also for some time, but. We will we will think um, of maybe getting new members and so on, and then see that we can get this up and running. You also do some of your well, you've been an interviewer on podcasts. You've been in my seat on podcasts. What's it like being that side of a podcast? You mean being a, being guest. a host? Uh, what's it like being like being the guest of a podcast rather than the other way around? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, because I have been uh, the host of a campus podcast in data science. Um well, you don't have to prepare. <laughs> you don't have any work, right? You don't have to set up any kind of uh, um, technology and so on. And yeah, it's really fun. I mean, either way, right? It's uh, fun to share your story and so on. But I do also really enjoy having a guest talking about whatever kind of different topic, because I think every time someone has a story to tell and you learn something, and I always say a day where I didn't learn anything is a, almost like a wasted day or so. And I try to make sure <laughs> I learn something new every day. Yeah. So you had, uh, we, we, we talked about some of the volunteering, the other mm -hmm. big chunk of your, the other half of your life, if not more than the, the other half of your life for your children. I think you've got more than one child, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, not, not quite half because I am now 43, I have to think. <laughs> And my son is turning 10 in four weeks and my daughter has turned last month five. So, yeah, that's that's definitely, well, obviously um, having a child halfway through a PhD, that was quite something. It was definitely a challenge. In hindsight, I don't even know how I've done this writing a book with a baby crawling on the floor. Many, many sleepless nights, um, but I've done it. I defended my uh, PhD when he was one year old. But by the time I was already postdoc, so that was a tough time. And I mean, when you are a good team, the entire family, then uh, that works. Yeah, but it's 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 been uh, tough. And I mean, when I don't know um, how to say that. This is this is obviously another thing I'm really passionate about. Is this whole women on maternity leave, and because <clears throat> another interesting story of mine is actually that when I now am. Um, this laureate of the so-called Beni Award, which is quite um, yeah good for Dutch scientists. Um, and I was invited to the interview already uh, 
a year before I was awarded. I was awarded 2020 and the year before. And that round of interview didn't work quite as well because I was in labor. I mean, I was standing there 30 kilos extra. I trouble breathing and I thought, oh, please, baby, stay in there for another hour. It was, I mean, and now I'm laughing about it. But in that moment, I'm in pain. I'm thinking I'm worried because I was unemployed at the time with the idea of being at home with two kids was, oh, no, not so great, you know, but OK. Um, or maybe, yeah. What can I say? That was not a, a great situation to be in. Unfortunately, it didn't go through. Um, so they had no mercy with me, <laughs> although uh, I had very high grace, but OK. Um, what I liked was that the now president of the university, back then rector, she said, hey, come to my office, tell me the story. How can that be that they invite you on that day to the interview? Um, and then uh, I put it on social media and I remember I got a lot of uh, reactions. And then another funding organization reached out to me and said, hey, let's talk. Then we had a couple of meetings and afterwards they actually changed this whole scheme. You can now upload a video. <clears throat> and uh, I thought it is impossible to have two days in the year. What if this one particular day falls on the day you go into labor? I mean, yeah. Um, so that's why I was very, um, how do you say, doing quite some advocacy on you can't have an interview even in your maternity and afterwards. And um, the amount of women that reached out to me and said, yeah, I went there breastfeeding. Uh, my baby was in intensive care and I had to prepare an um, interview. This is, yeah, no, I mean, this is this is not, <laughs> this is not how it should be. Yeah. And, yeah did you take much time off after having your child? Well, you're, you're well, second, you're the second one, so you were five years. I mean, th this is another thing. I think <laughs> I think you should never call it time off because a maternity leave is really, I mean, it's what is it, feeding and changing diapers and you are busy, you know, you are really busy. <laughs> so it's, it's never, you don't have time for anything else, uh, basically. And the time you have in the Netherlands is this, yeah, 12 weeks, 16 weeks uh, range. And that's it. Um, that, that, that's the time you have with your baby. But I had a, a sick leave, which was many months. So I was from halfway through my pregnancies on sick leave, bed rest. So, but th that was uh, also not really fun to experience. But then luckily, I am yeah super grateful that I have two healthy kids and uh Speaking to women in my environment, I realized that is, yeah, infertility is there um, and so on and so forth. And I, I mean, I touched upon this in my, on my blog that I also lost one baby in between um, at 11 weeks. And yeah, that was something what I felt was needed to speak about it publicly as well. And uh yeah, that was another one of these viral stories where so many women were saying they experienced this as well. What I really liked about it was the fact that I said, you know what, I talked to my former PI about this and he said, take the time you need. So I took three, four weeks off and um, I shared this online. And then some other women would say, because of you, I had the courage as well to ask for time off because going through something like this you i mean as far as i'm concerned I, I i would just go to the office and i would cry you know i wasn't i was absolutely useless and i remember my supervisor then said why are you here well, you know go home and i know that this is uh fortunate to have not everyone has this but i just really want to wish that this would be possible for everyone but number one is saying that you actually experience it and i realized that most women are embarrassed to to share this with anyone for that matter yeah why do, why do you think do you think it's it makes everyone look weaker because i think from a male side if there's something personal going on big generally they wouldn't try and show it at work is it because they're not wanting yeah. to go so weakness maybe it's um 
when it comes to mental health and anything like that, obviously, or that any type of disease and so on, anything where you're struggling, because in academia, there's high competition, you need to be strong, or that's what you think, right? And um, with this whole topic on miscarriage and infertility, it's this whole um, shame, I think. I mean, I most certainly didn't have that, but I know from uh, other women, they go through this. They say, I, I feel like I... Yeah, this sounds absolutely ridiculous, but as in, it's the duty of me as a as a woman. I need to be pregnant. I need to be capable of having a child, a healthy baby. And when I cannot do this, then something is wrong with me. And that's some yeah, that is very sad because obviously it's not your fault. And uh, yeah, that's yeah. But that's the strength of the blog, isn't it? And the strength of sharing your story because again, because so many people don't talk about it. Yeah. The prevalence isn't as obvious. Yeah, and once exactly. people talk about it, people realize yeah. actually it's not normal, but it's normal. It's not it's yeah. not there, they're not alone, it's not yeah. it's not something to be ashamed of. It's not it's it's life. And it's, it's so, which is why it's so yeah. important to share that. I, I I would agree with you. It's it's, yeah. it's absolutely true. And I mean that's why I said the amount of women that would uh, reach out to me and then also once I shared mine, a couple of others shared theirs, and I think one of the most horrific ones was when someone, uh, um, another woman shared that she was at her PhD, how do you call this, Viva, I think, in, in the Netherlands, uh, in the UK, sorry. And at that moment, she, at this very moment, she miscarried her child. And I don't want to get too graphic, but it's obviously you are in horrendous pain. And how can you, and she would say she wouldn't, yeah, she would mask it. I don't even know how, uh, and then the, how can that be, you know? And then uh, others would say, "Oh, I experienced this the same, the same, and and and." And then uh, it really helps. Plus, also those who have written say it was almost like a therapy effect. I mean, I'm not saying it's therapy. Please don't get me wrong, but the whole writing aspect is is very um, helpful in this moment when you maybe have never spoken about this with anyone. Yeah. Have you reflected, uh, with all your advocacy and uh, making things aware, how many people's lives you may have affected in a positive way? Have you ever thought about that? Hmm. Do you mean how many people have affected my life in a positive way? No, no, no the other way around. How many people, you know, because oh. <laughs> you've never got the content, the people have read it. How many people have you actually helped? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever thought about it? Just how many I that mean, would, yeah, I, positive, I don't know. Positive if, if influence. You, yeah, if you just look at the hard facts, so to say, which is maybe, let's say, a DM on Twitter or maybe also on LinkedIn. I mean, you can count them. And I think I stopped counting at a couple hundred. I don't know, but way more uh, than the comments on social media, several hundred. I don't know, honestly. and And lots of people say, well, I am following quietly along and I don't comment or I never really because, you know, and then that, that's that's a good question. And that's why I said that the views are several million. So you you count. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a lot. And I think that's something to yeah. be really proud of and an amazing accomplishment. <clears throat> uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that is uh, in a way true, I think. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, n I never really uh, thought, oh, I'm so proud of this accomplishment. I always thought, my God, these people are suffering in silence. I wish to help. And I always thought, what can I do? I'm just one person. But this is an example of what can you accomplish if you are just one person? Then you ask another person for help. Um, and then I remember where, when I went to... Uh, I went uh, through the forest for a walk with a friend of mine and I told her about this. Yeah, I have this idea of doing this blog, but I'm really afraid. I was nervous. You can't even comprehend how nervous I was and so afraid because, I mean, who is putting a story of their own suicide attempt on the internet? I, I, I thought this not in a gazillion years would I do this. Um, and then uh, she said, yeah, it's a great idea. Do it. And I thought, okay, hit online and then I go oh god it's online <laughs> and then 
you know, you want to hide under under somewhere, but <laughs> it's uh, it went it went well, I would say. <clears throat> so it's always this. Sometimes we need to push through fear. I mean, I I know it's hard, but this is there's always something on the other side. Oftentimes, at least, yeah. Moving on to the work life balance. How do you balance having your own lab now or starting your own lab, having your children? How how do you, how do you balance that? Yeah, so it's a good question, and I think I sometimes I wonder if there's such a thing as a work life balance. Um, but I also do believe that having children is actually helping me more than the other way around. I mean, obviously it's it's uh, it's a blessing to have them, but I sometimes thought. Back in the day, my PhD supervisor said, oh, um, they are helping you. And I thought, hey, what does he mean? They're helping me. And if they, if I wouldn't have children, I think I would only be doing advocacy and working and in the lab and so on. And this is actually taking time off and learning to be in the moment. So last week we uh, had a week of holidays and it was just, you know, water, ice cream, kids, that's it. No lab, no meetings, no nothing. And I have to be honest, I've struggled with that before. This whole taking time off and also mentally. Uh, you can sit somewhere but be not present, you know. You can be with your mind somewhere else. And it is in academia especially really hard. And I, it took some transition time for sure. And um, I would say my number one tool for this is the running. Which I was also going to say, because it, it's, yeah. you've got your family, uh, <laughs> got work, but actually, would you say running is your yeah. time where you kind of have a bit of space to think yeah. otherwise? And that, you know, I, I, I run, and I know when I yeah. run, I can just think about anything. And there, there is, sometimes it's work, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's anything. Yeah, uh, exactly. And yeah. Did I notice you ran your first, was it your first marathon recently? Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. So it's, uh, yeah, thanks. It was uh, actually last September. And um, yeah, I'm running for, I think now 30, uh, what am I saying? Since I'm 30. So since I'm 30, so that's now several years. <laughs> and um, I mean, I was already running, I don't know how many half marathons. I can't even count them anymore. And then I would run one time up to 35K. And then I thought, for whatever reason, I told myself I cannot run further, which is obviously nonsense. But this whole thing is, um, it sounds also very strange and you will understand, but this, this is a mindset shift. As in, I thought, you know what? I'm doing it. I'm training now. This is the plan. I stick to the plan and then it will be fine. And then the day came and then I ran and then it was completely mind-blowing to me that my legs were really cool with it so they were saying basically hey another 10k is good um but yeah it's we are capable of of more than we think that's the whole point i think the marathon next so uh <laughs> i mean i am intrigued by at least let's say 50k or so um but yeah, I don't know. I think maybe it's healthy to do another 42 and then see. But I mean, those 8K, I mean, <laughs> so, have you done uh, Ultra? Yeah, no, I did a 24 hour, 100 mile oh my God. run a couple of years ago. But Florian, Florian Jack does similar. He, he does. Similar. But actually, it's not that hard. It's just pacing. <laughs> A bit like your marathon. If you pace it right, you're good. If you go a bit too fast or too hard yeah. and don't read, Actually, I, I would rather I'd rather run the twenty four hour than try and race a marathon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Truly agree. I mean, this is this is this is also something I found very important um, to not think anymore about time. I mean, there was a time where I said I leave my watch at home. I'm not even tracking that because I lost the whole fun. It was only about oh no, I didn't hit my training goal, and oh that's bad, and I don't have my mileage and. Then I thought, okay, this this is not good. I need to enjoy the trees and the birds, and then it became fun again. So it's not about time, no. You see, see, in spring, I will go and count the number of species of bird I can hear or see <laughs> on the ground. So it's very so. And so that means sometimes you'll stop, yeah, and then carry on again. So it's 
it's it's much yeah. more running with a friend is is also you talk and you, you change your pace to suit each other and it's, yeah it's, that's i mean that's something i'm asked all the time by my friends and other people even someone who follows me on twitter says hey shall we go for a run but uh I cannot run with people. I've done this in the past that I ran with colleagues. But no, if I feel like I want to go faster, please do not disturb me. I want to uh, race today or I want to do hill reps or I want to do whatever or I want to be super slow and then I feel so bad. You know what I mean? It's just, I want to do my, that. that's that's my alone time. Please do not take this away from me. <laughs> no, no, I, I would have said the same. And yeah. I definitely, I, I was running marathons by myself, training by myself, didn't, yeah. I like my own company, my own pace, my own time, and then I ran with Stuart, and yeah, yes, and, and then, so actually, if he's running slow, I feel quite good about myself for going slow with him, so I get a yeah. feel, but actually, if it's the other way around, I think, well, I've been in his position, he understands, and we can always go off if we wanted to, but we never do. Yeah. Uh, and he doesn't mind you know, if he's feeling fit, so he'll do a few stretches and back a while, do some sprints and then come back. And take... <laughs> we, we are, yeah, yeah. It works nicely. And actually, Elmi, we have a small running group. Uh, oh, yeah. in the... I, I think I saw that on social media and then I thought, oh, I don't know. I mean, I've seen these running groups and I'm intrigued, but I don't know. I would feel, um, you know, there's this imposter syndrome thingy that's still come creeping into my my head and saying, yeah, you should run with them. They are so good and look at you. So um, it's I don't know. It's just, for Elmi, it's not, again, it's not about time. It's just about yeah. talking to different people and just sharing yeah. something. But all the exactly. other week runs are by myself. Yeah. 100%. And, uh, yeah, it, it's definitely true. But I mean, this whole... What you said earlier about this um, thoughts and running and so on. This is this. Um, I mean, a very um, yeah. How to say that? I really recall after a long day in the lab as a PhD student, I would come home, take off my shoes, put on my running shoes. That was the first thing I've done, and then just run. And then there's this point of what well, you know how you call this runners high, whatever you want to call this. But it's not thinking. And I remember during my PhD, this was almost the only time I could switch off my head. Because there's always this, oh, no, experiments and data analysis and writing and worrying. And you have a temporary contract. And then there's a child on the way. I mean, this is stress. <laughs> so Having children must make yeah. it more difficult to find the time. To run. Yeah. I, I go really early. My, mine are older now, so I can run really early. So I'm back before they're getting out of bed most of the time, certainly the weekends. Yeah, it's it's definitely a um, um, struggle, but I refuse to say, oh, I have kids, I can't. You know, Oh, I have children, I can't. I mean, obviously, it's, it's a lot tougher. Um, but then, yeah, what I just told you before we started recording, I um, got a treadmill now, which is, I always said, Oh my God, how can you, you know? Uh, for 10 years, I was only running outside. And now I really thought, okay, you know what? If you want to train for another marathon and you need to get your mileage and how on earth are you accomplishing this? Um, and I cannot leave my kids alone after the divorce, being with them alone. That's, you have to be creative and that's what it is. And on the bright side, what I really like is they know it. They know, okay, mom is doing that. Or oh, I got a runner, uh, runner's buggy and we would run outside and or well, I do whatever type of workout. And they basically are born with that. So it's also, I hope, an example that they um, follow at some point. I was going to make, do you actually listen to music on the treadmill? Uh, yeah, I am team music. Or oh, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You, you do listen to music. Yeah. So outside, I when I run outside, I don't use music at all. I like mm. the, I like to hear my surroundings, but inside on a treadmill. So, what do you listen to? Mm. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it's a mix, right? I like Madonna. I like all kinds of. I will not say all kinds of music, but I have I don't know what to have on there. Foo Fighters, ah, different things. Let's not talk about music. It's always so controversial. <laughs> But um, what I wanted to say was, yeah, I mean, obviously, when my kids are there and I have to listen to what they're doing, yeah, I cannot run with music. That's the thing. And, um, yeah, 
but they know uh, this is this is what is it twenty thirty minutes. I I cannot long, uh, run a lot longer. And uh, outdoors, I like music. I'm afraid that's maybe almost some people call it cheating. Yeah, I know that, but I really uh, enjoy that as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would ask if you I might some quick fire questions. Okay. okay. So are you an early bird or a night owl? Mm, both. <laughs> okay. PC or Mac? Oh, no Mac, no thanks. <laughs> okay. So, oh, okay, so McDonald's or Burger King? Yeah, McDonald's. Although since I one year I'm now vegan, and so that's why I mean McDonald's means for me uh, maybe a coffee or fries, and uh, that's also I try to really eat more healthy. And fries mm -hmm. is not exactly, but yeah, obviously the kids still like the happy meal, and we go there. So McDonald's. Your coffee. That is not a question. <laughs> That'll be coffee then, I presume. Oh, obviously coffee. I mean, a lot of coffee. Uh, that's that's the one thing I can't get off. I mean, I also quit alcohol a, a year ago, and that's all good. But you can't take my coffee away. Coffee and running is something I need. <laughs> I'll just take off my next question of uh, beer. <laughs> <laughs> what was your next question? Beer or wine? It's going to no. be neither. Because you, yeah. you stop drinking. But then it would be beer. That was yeah. before. Yeah. I, I will say, Anna, though. Yeah. <clears throat> cut down your caffeine intake and have it before your long runs. Yeah, it's... Then you then you can actually get your... Yeah, you, you bring down your receptors, you get yeah. enough, some caffeine kick for your long runs. And I mean, what I mean with coffee is also both normal coffee and decaf. It's just I like the taste and so I also... Yeah. But you see, I, I start to defend myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we I yeah, we I've lots of decaf choices. Yeah. Uh, chocolate or cheese? Mm, yeah, vegan, no cheese. But I mean obviously you have vegan cheese, but it's uh, chocolate. I mean, that's definitely I still have dark chocolate, which I really like. Yeah. Okay. Now, eat in or eat out. Mm, also, I prefer cooking myself and I know what's in there. Also, my kids both have a milk allergy, so I really enjoy. If if you would have told me uh, two years ago, one day you would say that, I wouldn't have believed you because then I didn't like cooking at all. But now I really enjoy cooking and making healthy choices. Sounds lame, but it's true. Is that a new hobby? What, a is new it a hobby? question? A new, a new hobby is cooking over yeah. the rest. It's I, I know yeah. it's essential, but it's, it's also good fun. TV or book? Mm. Yeah, I would say book. But now with kids and so on, we <clears throat> we watch sometimes movies. And well, since kids, you know, the movie number goes up quite a bit. Before it was books. Since. My mom told me um, in early school days, I had very quickly, once I learned reading, 400 books or so. I mean, she said you were glued to a book. I was obsessed with it and, yeah, books. Oh. Yeah. Talk fiction, those books. Mm, yeah, well, as a child, fiction, right? All kinds of different stories and so on. And now um, also, yeah, a mix. Okay. So, What's your yeah. favorite film? Mm, I like <laughs> this is not embarrassing maybe I like Sleepless in Seattle for example um, I like Mrs. Doubtfire a lot uh, <laughs> I don't know these Ooh, kind of things good yeah. answers Star yeah. Wars or Star Trek mm, none no that's none. okay uh, I can't ask your favourite music because you said it would be too controversial <laughs> so if you go away, are you someone who's going to relax on a beach or are you a culture vulture and want to be going out every day exploring mm. new sites? That's also, I think that changes over the years. I mean, before I was definitely team, I think teenager years, uh, beach, then it was definitely culture, boring at the beach. And now it's it has to be a mix. Yeah. Yeah. The Netherlands or Germany? Hmm. I would say... Oh, God. 
my entire family will not cringe. Um, I think by now that I live here for 13 years, it, it became my home. My kids are here. Um, so it's the Netherlands. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh God, <laughs> <it> just offended. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean, the, the, the whole man mentality of the people, I mean, it's not so a hierarchy, it's quite, yeah, it's open, it's, it's, uh, what, I leave it there. Yeah, that's a good, uh, favorite technique? Mm, microscopy or what? <laughs> what do you favorite mean? microscopy technique. Ah, favorite microscopy, mm, that's a tricky one, I don't know, now, nah, hmm. I don't know. I I mean, I've worked for so many years. I want to say, what was it? Eight years or so with uh, also to Photon. And mm -hmm. I really like that. Pretty much the same amount with light sheets. So I'm torn. This oh, one is a... Here, it's I, gonna, I was guessing light sheet or two Photon. And... Yeah. 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 And I mean, obviously, I like other techniques as well. But everything has its place, I think. <clears throat> Writing a grant application or writing a paper for manuscript? Mm, grant application. Because it's more, I don't know, there you can be a little bit speculative. It can be a little bit, uh, yeah, what you wish to do. Um, and yeah, that's fun. Favorite color? Mm, I like blue and I like black, but that's not a color, I think. And then obviously, whatever sample you have, uh, you look at the microscope, uh, look at, um, yeah, probably lots of people say fluorescent colors, but. <laughs> no, I was just about to say, I don't think anyone has yet said electrofluorate, yeah. nearly die, or gappy, or yeah. something. Yeah. I don't think anyone said. Then that, that's, that's something I thought, oh, that's too generic, so I'm not saying that, but then it would be red. I mean, I like good red, yeah. Okay. Of that, we, we talked about some difficult times. What would you say has been the best time in your career to date? Mm. Oh, that's a difficult one. Ooh, I would say in every phase there was a great time. I think looking back, you you see, you know, you zoom out and then you look at something where you are, for example, your PhD student, you feel like it's struggling and it's really hard. And now I see the great aspects as well. And I would say in every phase of my career, the best times were when I was learning something new and I was really in, integrated in a team and doing team science. And I, I would obviously say wherever I did microscopy, but that was everywhere. So the last 15 years. Yeah. Okay. So that's probably it. Yeah. So we talked about starting a new lab. This is exciting times. Uh, yes. <clears throat> what's most scary what are you it's, thinking oh this is this oh what, what are you going yeah. what most daunting at the moment it's it's uh, a mix obviously it's a mix i mean that's what i said when we were speaking about this earlier it's something like uh, you are really scared of but when you once you break over this hurdle or you break through this fear there is something exciting over there and what i what i'm really excited about is this whole topic of uh patient-driven cancer research, being among the these other researchers that work on the same. There's such a team spirit. I like that a lot. Scary is this, yeah, I need funding, for example. Um, what I tweeted a few days ago, uh, another grant that fell through, yeah. But I am not, uh, I don't know, I'm not scared. It's about, I mean, too, too scared, you know. I mean, the scary part, I think, was this, Oh, shall I, shall I, after eight years of working here, switch and almost like start over at my age? Once I made this decision, a lot of the scary part was taken away, I would say. Yeah. And you have the support of your university to take you into the position. So you're also supported and you have their endorsement, which is a, a very strong point. How did you yeah. feel when the grant was unsuccessful? Um, well, that is unfortunate. I mean, then you think, too bad. I try again. I mean, it's it's never really not. Who wants to hear that? But I always believe in this sounds lame, but rejection is redirection. Because then I reached out to my collaborators and so on, and they said, 
we still believe in that idea. I most certainly believe in that idea. So let's go for it. Take another call, write a new grant, um, and we will submit that soon. And let's hope that this works. Then it's all fine. <laughs> it's, it's quite cool. It, it, I, I think a few hours you feel pretty pretty rubbish for a few hours. A bit disappointed, but then certainly after a sleep, generally oh, balance. No, I I mean I understand what you mean, and that was maybe. I felt like this maybe in my PhD when I got like certain criticism on something where I thought, oh, I really like that. For example, you write your first article and then it gets better and better. But with this one, it was maybe, I want to say, I'm not going to lie, five minutes. Wow. And I thought, oh, yeah, but it's, it's this whole thing, putting it in perspective. And that's why I say my, the, the how do you say, the joy of being able to do this research is higher than this. And I know it's going to work because I believe in that. And it's the same with when I was doing a specific uh, development of a microscope technique or when I was building the light sheet in our lab. When when you, when you people ask you, when is it finished? Or what are you actually going to do there? What on earth are you doing the entire lab and the a day in the lab? And as long as you believe this is going to work, then this is going to work. And it will, you know. I would yeah. also say second time round, because you've taken the criticisms, generally, yeah. those criticisms make it better. So the second yeah. time round, you realise the research you're doing is more mature, it's more yeah. thought about, it's more direct, so it hits the ground running better than it would have been in the first. So, yeah. Yeah, but I take, I take a few hours. I can't do it in five minutes. <laughs> generally, especially if I think it's a very good one. If, it's, if you put it, chance your arm, so suddenly just feel more passionate about than others. Yeah. And, and yeah. you really want you just feel as though it's just hit that note and it's just right. I know, but I know, I know what you mean. And I think when I this this one story I told you after I was pregnant at this interview, when I also got the no, I also thought, come on. That took me also maybe a couple of hours, but that or maybe a day or two, you know, but then you can't dwell on it too long and then that's why I think, you know, back on the horse, you, you, I made this choice myself, so I might as well get on with it. So <laughs> I've noticed, just noticed, we are, we have just gone the hour. I don't know where okay. that time's gone. I've got to ask you one more question, though. Yes. If you could do any job for a day to try mm. something different, whose job or what type of job would you like to try? Yeah, I mean, as a child, I always wanted to be a veterinarian, so maybe that's something I would want to do. Uh, although, yeah, maybe mm, I also like uh, maybe working in a museum, <laughs> something completely mm -hmm. different, or uh, something in the direction of zoology. I mean, this is still really cool. Mm, I don't know. Probably, if I if I think about it more, there's more. I mean, anything with sports is also really fascinating. You know, I stop here. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So, Anna, yeah. thank you for your time. I, yeah. I, I wish we had longer. Uh, I'm sure <laughs> we could talk about and touch on. But Anna, you've been a great guest. Uh, and also, for those listening and watching, there is a mental health special as well with Kadar and Beth, uh, which should be coming up just before this episode. If you haven't seen it already, it's well worth a, a listen to on that. And please subscribe to the channel. Please go and look at annashoot.com uh, oh. and have a look at... Uh, the content that's on there because it truly is inspiring Anna you are the person that is truly inspiring because that website is yours and your content Anna I'm very honoured and thank you very much for talking so frankly today yeah thank you the pleasure was mine and uh, yeah I um, hope everyone is enjoying this episode and maybe we can put in the little I don't know how you call it, the show notes or something a few links to organisations and I can send you an email that might be really helpful for those who seek help also uh, as well. Yeah. Well, that's certainly possible. So go to the YouTube, it'll be on there and we'll see if we can get it on the actual, just a landing page as well. So Anna, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the dash microscopists.